Okay. All right. So in the previous video, we made our initial graph, <clears throat> which is shown over here. I realized as I was taking a break that the work that I'd already been doing on the blog is not actually looking at cumulative cases, but incident cases, the number of new cases per day. We've already calculated that, so it's actually pretty easy to change the graph. We just change this, we'll say incident cases. There we go. Oh, it didn't update because I saved it to this object. So let's print that object, see what that looks like. Interesting. Okay, so this looks actually much more um, exponential, right? It's scattering around that straight line to, uh, to a much greater degree. That's interesting, I have to think about that. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Cool, well, so what I wanna do now is I wanna fit that linear model so that I have it as an object and then um, make some predictions over the next few days. So I only fitted the model up to March 5th, but we've now got data up through March 16th. So I can actually fit the model and then forecast predictions out and see how my model performs. This is really, I think, the most important thing that we can learn how to do, um, not just for disease epidemiology, which, I mean, epidemiologists already do this, so do weather forecasters, but ecologists need to figure out how to do this. Um, so that's sort of my goal. How do we do predicting in ecology? And here's an opportunity to sort of learn in real time how simple ecological models um, make predictions. All right, so let me just, there we go. So what I'm gonna do, I, let's see, I, I need to take the logarithm of my incident cases and my linear model is not gonna be very happy if I feed it the date. Um, what's gonna happen in that case is it's gonna tell me, it's gonna estimate parameters, but one of those parameters that I'm interested in, the, the intercept of that, is actually going to be relevant to the year zero. And I don't want the year zero, I want 2020. So I gotta, what I gotta do is center my data by subtracting off something that I'm interested in. In the blog post, I've been using February 27th, which was around the time when the cases in the US really started to take off. I'm using that as the zero point. So I'll do the same thing here. That'll make the parameters of my, the, the linear model that I'm about to fit comparable with what I have in the uh, blog post. So let's see. So we're gonna take our data, Italy confirmed, and I'm gonna, should I do this here? Yeah, I can do this here. Doesn't matter actually. Um, filter and I want date less, oops, what did I use? Less than or equal to 2020 March 5th. Okay. That's just gonna give me the data that's currently in the graph. Now I need to mutate because I need to calculate some more variables. I need two variables. I need um, the log of my incident cases. So let's call that log incident cases. Kind of long, but it's okay. Log, oops, log 10 incident cases. Um, I like to run these things as I go along so that I, you know, if there's an error, I figure out when I made the error more quickly. Incident cases, one variable, log incident cases. Let's see if that actually looks good though. There's a handy thing and sometimes, like in this case, I haven't actually saved the object yet. So I can just say last dot last dot value. And that is going to be log incident cases. Yeah, there we go. I'm using log base 10 because that's what's on the graph. I could use the base of natural logarithms. I'd have to fiddle with my graph to uh, get that to work. Um, as long as I keep the bases consistent, it sort of doesn't matter too much. 
which one I'm doing. Okay, so my logs, logarithms worked. I'm gonna calculate my new variable. This is gonna be the thing we'll use on the x-axis. I'm gonna call it day. And day is going to be my date variable minus um, the date that I want to use as zero. So I do date and um, 2020-02-27. And I get an error. Error in unclass as date minus this non-numeric argument to binary operator. Well, that's a bit convoluted. <laughs> but the problem is that's a binary, that minus sign is what's called a binary operator. It's got two parts, the thing on over there and the thing over there. This thing, okay, could be a number. But this is a character string. And minus is not smart enough by itself to figure out that it should convert that to a date. So we have to do it for it. And we use the lubridate function ymd because we've got year, month, day. And there. Now let's see what I end up with. Always pays to look at the calculations. Huh, look at that, it actually worked. I wonder what the, hmm. well, oh, I see, here we are, day. That's actually still a date time object. I'm not sure that's just what we want. Um, so what I'm gonna do, uh, hmm. well, let's leave it for now. See what happens. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is now I'm going to fit my linear model. The function that does this in R is LM for linear model. And the first argument that I want to use is the data. So the pipe is gonna feed me the data, but for LM, the data is not the first argument. So I'm gonna have to specify it and I put a period there. The period just says to the pipe, put the thing here. And then I'm gonna put the formula, and this is what's gonna define the model. So log incident cases, and then I have a, that's gonna be the Y variable, the dependent variable of my linear regression. Log incident cases, and I have um, day. All right, let's see what happens. There we go. Sort of worked. That's remarkable. I think it worked. How would I know if it worked? Well, let's try, let's force this thing to be a number. And then double check. Same result. Okay, so it was smart enough to convert day into a number. So that's kind of nice. And now what I want to do is save that model. So this is going to be Italy financial model. Run that again. So it doesn't give me any output down here, but up here I've got a Italy exponential model object. Okay, so now we can do things with that model. Um, if you wanted to take a more detailed look at it, we can do that summary Italy exponential model. Um, the residuals look pretty good. There's our intercept. So the way to interpret that is on February 27th, there were 10 to the power 2.23 cases, new cases. So on February 27th, there were 170 new cases. That's what the model's estimating. In fact, there were a few more than that, but um, that's, that's where we're at. 
This is telling us how many new cases we get per day, the sort of the rate at which they're being added. And it's in units of log 10 of the number of cases, which is sort of weird, but um, it's a daily growth rate. Uh, you can compare this growth rate with what I got in the blog post for the United States, again, over a similar span of days, but, sh but shifted a bit later, right? So the US started a bit later than Italy did. The US, the number for the US here is about 0.14. So that's a bit alarming because uh, Italy's rate of growth in new cases was lower than what we've been seeing in the United States for the last two weeks. Yikes. Um, this is a highly significant regression, so it's pretty clear that there's, yeah, the longer the epidemic goes on, the higher the number of cases. That's not really a surprise. So we're pretty happy with that. Okay. Now that we've saved our object and we've sort of thought about it a little bit, um, now what do we want to do is make some predictions. And so what we have to do is I'm going to basically figure out when are the days, um, what was the last day of my, let's see, Italy confirmed. Oh, I did that down here. I can look at that up here. Yeah, so my last day was the 7th, seven days after February 27th. Um, and what I, so what I wanna do is make predictions for days eight, nine, 10, et cetera, et cetera, out to March 20 something, no, 16. So if I look at Italy confirmed, uh, I can just count them up here. So I started, I went from there. So I need to make one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten predictions. So I need to go from seven to seven, or sorry, from eight to seventeen. Let's do that. I'm gonna make make a data frame called predicted. I'm actually going to use this function tibble a equals 8 to 17. And, and that's actually all I need, right? Because that's the only, the model, if I say, give me the average values for day, it's going to be able to tell me what the expected number. I just touched my face again, say 20 times per hour. By the way, I'm sniffing all the time. Keep in mind, sniffling and nasal drainage is not a symptom of COVID-19. It's a symptom that it's spring and I have issues. Uh, okay. So the function that we use to make predictions is surprisingly enough called predict. And what predict wants is a model. So we give it a model object. And then um, we can just run that. And what it will do is it will give us the, um, these, are, these are the expected values over the 13 days. So this is essentially the value of each of these points along this blue line here, or the log base 10 of each of those points along the blue line. Um, but I don't want that. I want, I want those points for the future. So I just tell it, don't use the data from the model, use the data from my predicted thing. And so there's an argument called new data predicted. We can run that. And it gives us some, again, a vector of numbers. Um, but I also want the standard error of that, of those predictions. How, how accurate is that predicted mean based on the information that we currently have? And so for that, I use this argument se.fit, and I just say true, by default it's false. If I run that, I then get, uh, I get my fit object, I get the se fit, so this is the standard error of that. This ribbon here, this 95, is a 95% confidence interval, so it's roughly two times the standard error 
uh, um, added up above and below the line. And so when you're close to the mean of your x values, you get a very narrow confidence limit, and then it expands outwards. And we get some other stuff that's useful, the degrees of freedom of our model and the residual scale of our model. So we're gonna be able to use all of that information to calculate the distribution of the expected values in the future. Um, but, so that's a lot of stuff. It comes back as a list, which isn't all that convenient to work with. So I'm just gonna call this object predicted list. And so now instead of printing it to the screen, it puts it in an object right there. There's my cool stuff. And so now what I wanna do is I wanna pull the parts of that out and add them to my predicted data frame. And then I have to do some, some mutating. So I'm gonna do predicted Well, I guess I can do this all in one step. Okay, so let's, let's do this like this. So we're gonna take our predicted data frame, just has one column, and I'm gonna mutate it to add some more columns. Uh, to plot it on this graph, I need the date again. I have the day, but I don't have the date. So I, the date is going to be IMD, 2020, 03, oops, 2022, 27. That's the date we use to get zero, right? Dang it, touch my face again. And, um, and then I'm gonna add oops, day to that. Okay, now I need my fit. And that's gonna come from that list. So it's predicted list. And I can use the dollar sign to pull elements of that list out. And you can see it helpfully pops up. These are the things that are in the list. And you can see fit is predicted list dollar sign SE fit. Okay, so that would be enough for me to get the confidence limits on the mean, on the expected number of cases per day. But what I'm observing over time is actually the, not the expected number of cases per day, sorry, yeah, my observations are actually the, the actual number of cases per day. So what I need instead are what are called prediction intervals. I need to know what the full distribution of the observations is conditional on this model. So to do that, I have to get, um, I have to add the variance of the, the residual variance of the model to the variance of my mean, and that together is gonna give me the variance of, of the whole distribution, right? Because my, my mean is uncertain, so there's some variance there, and then on top of that is the variance in the, the amount of error in my normal distribution. So add those two together, that's gonna to tell me the variance of my, um, of my district, my observations, which is what we're seeing now out in the future. So the predicted variance is going to be the SE fit, which is a standard error, so I have to square it. Sorry, you haven't done intro stats, this might not make a lot of sense, but uh, yeah, it's okay. I have, we have classes that can help you with that, but um, I'm just gonna run through this anyway. And now the residual scale, that's this down here in our list, that's the number that I need to get the, the variance. So I could predicted list residual scale and also is on the standard error, so I have to do the square. I'm gonna add those two things together and that's gonna give me my predicted variance. Um, let's run this thing before we get too far. Make sure there's no errors. Yep, that looks good. Oh, that's only going to the 15th. Huh. Uh, did 
I think I have to the 16th. I do. I do have to the 16th. Okay. So that means I need 8 to 18. You see why the advantage of writing out the code in a script is I can just change that one number and then run everything again. And now I get it out to the 16th. Okay. Sweet. You can see these numbers are going up by about 0.1. That's that slope, right? 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, and so on. All right, now I want the lower prediction limit. Oh, right. I see what I need to do. Okay, so the lower prediction limit is going to be my fitted value minus the square root of the predicted variance. That's the number before it. Times, and I'm, you could just multiply by two, but we've only got um, 11 degrees of freedom here. So I'm gonna do the T distribution value for 11 degrees of freedom. So this is 0 0.975. We're averaging after 95% confidence or prediction interval. And degrees of freedom are I'm just going to type them in 11. It also, you know, typed out this long thing and got the degrees of freedom that way, but I just don't want to type too much. And I'm going to copy that. Come on. Up, oop. Paste. To get the upper limit. I just add and change that. Okay, let's run that. That looks good. And I'm just gonna stick that back into the predicted list. So that predicted list now has what are the values I was predicting for, the dates, and then what are the expected values. Hopefully some of you are seeing the error that's about to crop up. Um, so what I want to do now is I've got my base graph, P1, plus, and I'm going to add a line. And I have to change the data because the data that, it, that geom line is going to inherit from the P1 object is the, the underlying data, but I don't want to I don't want to um, use that information. Predicted. And then I need my mapping. And that's going to be um, I'm going to specify. It, it's actually going to know that date is supposed to be the x-axis because that's what was the x-axis in P1. And but I didn't change fit. So let's see what this ends up looking like. Oh, what's going wrong? So there's our new points. They're in the right place on the x-axis, but they're way wrong. So the issue is, uh, is that all these calculations are on the log of log base 10, log base 10 of our observations. So what we have to do is raise them to get them to match on this graph. We have to raise them to the power of 10. So I better go back and do that. 10 to the power of all this stuff. Okay. Oh, and that's gonna affect my fit as well. So let's, let's recalculate fit as 10 to the power fit. This might look a little odd, but it actually works because mutate takes these things in order. So first it's gonna pull out the fit, then we use that fit right here on the log scale, and then we're gonna raise it to the power 10 so that it can be plotted. And, and this has already got a bunch of stuff in it, so I'm gonna remake this and see what happens. There we go. So see, it's that line is now lining up perfectly with um, those observations there. 
So how do we get this nice gray ribbon, it's called? Well, here's a function called geom ribbon. And data is going to be predicted. Mapping equals equals date. And now um, we have different aesthetics for the ribbon. The ribbon needs two values for each x, two y values for each x, the minimum and the maximum. So y min is going to be our lower prediction limit. And y max will be our upper prediction limit. There we go, or not. Object incident cases not found. Um, it always takes me a terribly long time to find this error, but in this case, the reason is if we go back to P1. Where do you go? P1. We specified in P1 that Y is incident cases. We come down here and we look at our ribbon. It's got x equals date and y min and y max, but because it's inheriting all that information from P1, it also wants to look in predicted for incident cases. Then it's not there. So that's why it's that's why it's doing this. There's a couple different ways to solve this. Um, the way that I prefer to do it, I'm going to come back up here. Uh, is to take y equals incident cases out of the ggplot object, okay? When it's here, all of the geoms get that y aesthetic. But as we just saw, it's not always applicable to all the geoms, right? So in this case, we want it to be, we need it in here. So we have mapping equals AES y equals incident cases. And then here, we also have to provide, so it's relevant, map, uh, mapping equals AES cases. I think that should work now. Yeah, so actually we won't know until we print it. Yeah, okay, so that works. Now what we've got is, let's see, we ran that. Now down here, now we should be able to run this. And geom ribbon is not going to look in the predicted data frame for incident cases because it hasn't inherited that value from P1. Okay. Well, it's not quite what I wanted, but it's close, right? So there's our prediction interval, but it's way too dark. Um, we'd ideally like to be able to see things through that. And the way we do that is with an, an aesthetic called alpha for alpha transparency. We can actually use, we can make this depend on a variable, but in this case, I just want, I want it to be about 25% transparent. So there's that. And now, I want to do one more thing. I want to add the points that are hopefully inside that ribbon. I'm going to do geom point. Um, let's see, P1, da -da 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 -da. P1 was filtered. So now what I want to do is, is reverse that filter and I want. Well, I can. Well, let's do it this way. I just need this part. So I want data equals filter Italy confirmed, but now I want dates that are greater than that. And I need a mapping. Y equals, it's going to be incident. There they are. Wow, fascinating. 
Hmm. So um, if the number of new cases per day continued to grow as it had between the, um, what is that, 21st of February and the 5th of March, then we would expect our points to be falling inside this line. And they mostly are. There's a couple points that are outside and low. The other thing that's happening is these points are starting to, these are, they're actually mostly below the expected value and that's becoming more and more common. So I think what's happening is that if you look back at what's gone on in Italy, um, around the beginning of March was when they really started to tighten up the social distancing. And it takes a few, because of the fact that, you know, there's already people who've gotten sick, right? These are reported cases, so it's gonna take a while before the effects of social distancing start to show up. But what they should show up as is as a steady, as a kind of a decline in the number of cases as we go forward. So there you go. That's now done the entire figure and the analysis uh, that I've been using on the US data. Um, the only difference in the US data is that this step right here is more complicated because you know, be prior to March 8th, you have to use the county level data, and after March 8th, you have to use the state level data. So that makes it a bit more complicated to pull everything together for a country level analysis, but otherwise it's not too bad. Anyway, hope this has been interesting. I'll try and make another set of videos tomorrow. Stay well, wash your hands. Um, no. What am I doing? And maybe.